I want to welcome everybody to our latest podcast. This is a book review of the book Leadership and Self-Deception by the Arbinger Institute. So I want to uh, just welcome Lee Brower to talk about this book, which has been around for a few years, but I, I think because we uh, have a relationship with the Arbingers to respect their work deeply, I think it's something that uh, could be of great value to um, many of the people that work with us and follow our work. So, Lee, why don't I turn it over to you? I know that you have uh, quite a bit to share with people about this book. Thank you, Ron. Yes, I am excited to talk about this book a little bit. You know, um, I first read this book probably in the year 2000, maybe 2001, somewhere in that area, and it had a profound impact on my life at that time. It changed my vocabulary. It changed the way I looked at things. And uh, like most things, you know, you pick up one or two gems and you keep them and you use them and they become part of who you are. And later on in around 2007, I read it again. And again, this time it was like reading it over for the first time. I could remember some of the things that I'd incorporated, but it gave me even greater insight. And then again, you know, having used that uh, just recently, I had the opportunity to read it again a couple of times. And uh, because this time I did a little more digging, went in a lot deeper, and I was so uh, impressed by it that here is a, maybe a solution that might be able to help businesses, individuals, families be able to have a how on how they can actually you know uh, become better communicators can eliminate some of the problems in their businesses and in their families. Um, I have since recommended this book oh in the last um, three weeks let's say four weeks I have shared it with a number of my clients what I call our thrivers our thriver clients that are business family coach clients and uh, the response I've gotten from them is overwhelming the impact already just the vocabulary change and becoming bilingual in our coaching has been uh, extremely helpful here's one text I just got back um, the first text uh, from him came in last Tuesday and uh, so uh, and then he said, all he said was, leadership and self-deception is a painful mirror. <laughs> Nobody wants to be pain in pain. Uh, but then uh, I got a following one five days later that said, uh, when I sent you the text, I was only into the beginning. I am 95% complete and have never been so excited. Thank you for suggesting the book. I have purchased a copy for each of my team and plan to change our culture. And so um, I can understand his excitement, and he's not the only one. Um, you know, and it is a painful mirror. May I make a suggestion as you read the book, Leadership and Self-Deception? I'm going to encourage you this. As you start reading, for me anyway, and several people that I've talked to, their first 50 or 60 pages uh, are a little tough to get through because I start arguing with myself, and I start looking at the examples. The, the examples of how it's demonstrated is done in a fable format. So you're reading a story, and the story is based upon some fact and some fiction. An interesting thing about Arbinger is that you will not see the author's name on the book. Um, the reason being is that they all feel like the, the people that work with Arbinger and have the thought process feel like they've collaborated to make this book happen. I've been fortunate to meet the man that founded Arbinger and spent some time with him years ago and uh, understand his thinking a little bit better and know, and I can see his hand throughout. And as I've read it, knowing him, I can actually tie to some of the experiences that he's had. And so it made it a little bit more familiar for me, I think, as I read it. But, you know, um, so I, you know, in reading it, I decided that this is something. And, and Ron, interestingly enough, three years ago, he's had the opportunity to become exposed to it intimately, attended several of their seminars. And, uh, and we're very grateful that he's had the opportunity to understand Arbinger more. This particular book they estimate has been read by over 15 million people worldwide. 15 million people. Now Arbinger focuses primarily on businesses and doing workshops in businesses, but it's had impact not only in businesses but families everywhere. So at the, at the heart of it, you know, you have to think what is self-deception? So when you have leadership and self-deception, well self-deception is where you start interpreting things through your own eyes to the benefit of your own thinking. In other words, you deceive yourself but you don't realize it. Think of it like this. One of the examples that they give in the book is that uh, uh, you start with a new company, and the what and the and the and the how for you, or the what and the why, 
um, in that particular case becomes um, uh, the what becomes what can I do to strengthen you know to have results with this company and the who is the organization because you really want to do your very best for that but as time goes on the what changes as you become disenchanted with the business or things aren't going exactly right you move into that space of the what and now you replace that with yourself so your focus moves back on yourself and then when you and when you get into the who instead of it being the organization it becomes yourself and so really they use a term called being in the box or being out of the box and when you're in the box you're seeing others in a different light you look at them as objects and so we do it all the time you know that's the waiter that's the CEO that's the president that's that person and those objects serve a purpose in our lives and when the objects no longer serve a purpose or they're working against us then we have a tendency to push those objects out of the way or to lay blame on them or to have them cause our problems the deeper I got into it the more the ahas I guess the clearer the mirror became again if you want to follow that metaphor so I'm going to encourage you get past the first 50 60 pages don't argue with it and as you continue on you'll get greater and greater insight into how this has relevancy in your life the life of your family the life of your team members and everybody that you're really doing business with wouldn't you say that was your experience Ron as you absolutely absolutely I would I would just add uh, we've talked about this is that a big part of the arbiter work is um, answer the question how am I a problem for others and uh, that's that's a difficult question to face to begin with but the arbiter model and you articulated it well about uh, seeing others as objects is really the the crux of that is uh, the uh, uh, objectifying others and so seeing people as people and uh, part of the training for arbiter I think lends itself or kind of uh, uh, fits nicely with uh, Empowered Wealth's work, particularly with gratitude. And I was wondering if you might comment a little bit about that, Lee, because you and I have talked about that, how uh, Arbiter is really a great model for diagnosing and revealing some of the issues and problems. And yet we at uh, Empowered Wealth, I think, have pioneered an approach that might be part of the answer. So I, th I thought maybe you might articulate a little bit about that. Thanks, Ron. You know, as you're right, as I read through that, um, I, I'm not going to call it a missing component because what it gives you is it gives you a map on how to take and really get yourself out of the box to have better communication with people, to have better communication for yourself, make yourself more effective so that you're not wasting time in conflicts and actually not thinking that you're part of the problem. But really, you know, when you really understand that the problem lies here and you have within yourself the power to correct it, every time I read it as I went through it, gratitude kept popping up. What they're really talking about is gratitude and, you know, the concept of being in gratitude. And, uh, you know, and, and when you're in gratitude, you're constantly in a space where you can appreciate other people. You're not constantly comparing. You're not constantly blame, blame, or putting it on them, or putting. Things. When you're in gratitude, you're able to operate and continue in that space. When you're grateful for, many times that's a wonderful space to be. We're all grateful for things, and to be able to recognize and acknowledge the things that we're grateful for is very important. However, that may have a temporary position to because we're comparing to something else. You know, oftentimes I think about, you know, how we look at other people. Like even, you know, when when I have. Um, when I'm struggling with a problem, it's like I search out. I, I've been known. I've, I've, I've. I, let me just put it this way. I don't want to be. I don't want to have this be true confession. But there's times when we've all, I think, looked out at people and said, "Oh, it could be worse. I could be as sick as that person." And so, are we really rooting for somebody else to be sick so that we can feel better? And in the concept of self-deception, one of the things that I found very fascinating in it is that. Uh, you know, and it's, it's um, when you move into the box and you have collusion, so you're moving into a box and somebody else has moved into the box over here. So now you're clashing. And uh, so you start thinking, well, you know, this person's not good enough or this person's, why is this person in this position? They've never done this or they're in that position or they've never done that. And so you start then justifying 
why they're in that position instead of rooting for them. We even see this in senior management where senior management might look out and say that person, they just don't have it. They don't have it. And so you actually start rooting for them to get in the box because then you can say, see, I told you so. And so that, where is that in gratitude? That's just the absence of gratitude. You start rooting for somebody to fail so that you can say, yeah, see, I told you so. So that just moves them into the box. Right. And uh, uh, then in turn, uh, the, the people, you, you, once you start treating people as objects, then you start recruiting allies yeah. who, to support your position. And then that strengthens your justification. Then the other people who you're treating as objects, they rec start recruiting their own allies, and it becomes a vicious uh, circle, if you will. Yeah. You know, it reminds me a little bit. We start, we get trained as the young age, we start name calling. How often do we start name calling and kids in the playground, you know, oh, he's stupid, he's dumb. Well, that's the dumb kid, that's the smart kid, that's the athletic kid, that's this kid. And we start putting them in positions as objects, as salespeople when they go out and sell. You know, if they don't buy, they're a jerk. Or they put them in, you know, they put them in age categories, or they put them in health categories, or they put them in religious casual categories. And with that brings certain baggage. And so it's very difficult to have communication if you're always going in the box towards somebody. In fact, you start looking, instead of having communication, you start looking for justification. Harbinger even makes a point in their training how uh, people's need to justify is greater than most any other motivation that they might have. Uh, let me ask you another question, Lee. Uh, I know that we have talked a little bit about how this work, this model of Arbinger plus our material on gratitude especially, could be helpful to our clients, particularly your coaching clients. Uh, can you uh, comment just generally speaking about how, how you see that and what some of the possibilities might be? The process of um, recidivism, we've talked about that occasionally. You know, recidivism is usually associated with the uh, judicial system. There are judicial statistics, or excuse me, recidivism statistics that talk about the number of people that go through go to prison. That in the United States, roughly 68 percent, 69 percent of all prisoners that are released from prison are back within two to three years, and that's a recidivism rate. That's where people return to their previous behavior, and and when you talk about this emotion of justification being one of the strongest emotions that people have. And when you read the book and you have this aha moment, just like our friend that Tim that you know that sent me the text and others that we've shared the book with, including me, you know, how many how many times have I read it since two thousand and I'm still going, Wow. Okay. But if you start applying that with the empowered wealth principles, if you start understanding it with empowered wealth concepts and the tools that we have and the coaching especially, so our our process of a coaching, you know, it starts with gratitude, with appreciation. It starts, then it moves and, and carries with it the concept of attentiveness. And then thirdly, the process of accountability. So by becoming bilingual with the concepts that have been demonstrated through this fable and through actual experiences that we've had with Arbinger over the last 15 years that I've been exposed to them or longer, uh, and, and then of course with the training that we've had, um, we're able to see how to take the empowered wealth principles using the concept of being able to discuss them in a group and environment where people get it because all of a sudden that's what happens is they get it and that's what takes the time in learning is just getting it but when they get it and they realize that oh maybe I am deceiving myself maybe I am in self-betrayal what can I do how can I be a better tool to help others how can I move out of the box and stay out of the box those are the tools where Empowered Wealth comes together. So that merger of those two coming together and working with Empowered Wealth coaching actually helps elevate. It creates that level of, oh yeah, you're right, oh yeah. And we have that, that language that we can actually communicate better and put people on. And when you see that within a company, where the company starts to communicate amongst each other so that they can, they very quickly, are you in the box? Or I'm in the box with this particular person. Can you help me get out of the box? You know, it changes your dialogue. You're asking questions you've never asked before, and uh, you have much greater insight.
Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think that's probably a good place for us to pause uh, and just remind everybody that uh, we do have a uh, members-only uh, book review. We're going to go into a little more depth on, on how we might apply the Arbiter model and combine that with Empowered Wealth's um, uh, principles, concepts, and tools in order to achieve uh, what I would consider to be a unique benefit and a unique result for the clients of Empowered Wealth and for the clients of the Business Family Coach. So for those of you who have joined us on this public portion, thank you very much for uh, joining us for this book review. We'll have another one uh, shortly. But, and for now, let's uh, sign off this one. And uh, we'll, we'll start the members-only podcast momentarily.